you think he did well? I mean, from the way you say, I don't think he did well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. this episode of Mind the Gaps. It is a session in which we discuss and share various issues that students face um, and also try to address their learning and study gaps. In today's session, we will be discussing various issues on economics. It's an A-level subject and many students have problems facing um, you know, how to tackle this in the best way possible. And we're very happy today to have uh, Weilun with us. Weilun is our master teacher at Mind Stretcher. I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction of uh, Weilun. Weilun is an excellent student when he was schooling. At uh, RI, when he was doing his O-levels, he scored 10 A1s, right? Very, very good result. Not only that, he was a Prime Minister's Book Prize winner for bilingualism. And in addition to scoring straight A's at the A-levels, he also scored a distinction in H3, uh, H3 level economics and he is also an economist by profession, right? And Weilun has uh, graduated Summa Cum Laude, which is a first class degree honours from Columbia University and then he went on to pursue um, a master degree also in economics at Cambridge University. So as you can see from Weilun's um, excellent result as well as his uh, focus in economics. He is really well placed to say about a lot of things and give us valuable tips and insights on the A-level subject called economics. Welcome Weilun, let us hear from you. Okay, there has been a lot of contents right for economics and students feel that wow, you know they have to cram so many things in um, usually the lecture notes are very thick with hundreds and hundreds of pages. What is your advice to them in how to remember all these facts? Thanks Christy for, for having me here today and thanks for really cutting to the chase and really focusing on the core of the pain points and challenges that students face, uh, especially in the economics exams and studying economics as a subject. So actually here is, is quite interesting. So what you see here is students a lot of times, they struggle a lot mm. with memorizing the content for econs because there's just too much content to go through. As you mentioned, right, the lecture notes and all, it can go to 80 to hundreds of pages long. So actually I just recounted this um, this show that I really like. Um, it's, it's this variety show on TV. Mm. So it's called the Zui Xiang Da Nao. Right, so it's a Chinese variety show and it's uh, I think I've heard it, that. Yeah. <laughs> in English it's called the strongest brain. Mm. So what they do is actually on this show they will feature all the best talents uh, from China who are really good in terms of their brain and cognitive power. And one of the talents right that they really like to feature on the show is a uh, super memory. Mm. So actually I, I really had this really deep impression of this guy. Uh, he was you know he had this really good memory. So the thing is he was in charge of this uh, poker cards memorization. So it was a deck of about 52 cards. Uh. And then what they do is they got him to reshuffle the card, reshuffle it, right? Take about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So what he did was shh, 10 seconds, okay? So 10, 9, 8, all the way down to 1. And then he looked at it, right? He then recall which card is which, right? In terms of the position, right? From the top all the way to the bottom, oh. all 52 of them. And he managed to recall every single one of them. In a short span of 10 seconds, he could actually recall every single card. So that really shows how immense and how powerful memory is and how infinite human potential is. But why did I want to bring up that example, right? It's because it also really showed me how my limitations are really in this space of memory. And that's also the same for all students, right? Because the thing is, if every student could memorize like that guy on a TV show, then they probably wouldn't be studying in JC anymore, right? They'll be more like Elon Musk trying to build a rocket, fly to, fly to Mars and so on, right? But so the thing is then, it's not about memorizing, right? But how do you really internalize? How do you really master the economics content? It's about studying smartly. And how exactly do you study smartly? I would really think of it as three different aspects. So first, really, it's, it's about studying smart, right, by looking at the learning objectives. Having the learning objectives very clearly in your mind as you go about revising through the concepts. That's very important. 
So the thing is, for example, if you look at a chapter on demand and supply, 80 page, 90 page. And a lot of times, students like to what we call in Chinese, Ling Shi Bao Fu Jiao, right? So in English, it's last minute, uh, hug the Buddha's leg, right? So do everything <laughs> yes. last minute. Literal right? translation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, there's no way they can master so much content when they do it so last minute. Mm. And so what's important is, if you want to master the content, you need to go in with your eyes open. Mm. You need to be clear on what's the learning objectives. For example, demand and supply. What exactly is demand? What exactly is supply? How do you apply demand and supply to analyze different markets? Once you know these learning objectives, it will then guide you along, right? It will help to orient you as you study through all that thick stack of notes. So that's really the first part, right? Having the learning objectives very clearly embedded in your mind. Mm. Second, right? Second really is in terms of learning aids. So a lot of times students will just look at the thick stack of lecture notes, try to write some notes and all. It doesn't really help them. But instead of that, really what they can do is if they can look at it in terms of, you know, composing mind maps, right? Mind maps that will help to distill the key concepts mm. of each chapter and to accompany that with a glossary. So what I recommend here is really a glossary of key mm. terms and definitions, right? Mm. And what exactly do you focus on in terms of, you know, uh, crystallizing these mind maps and so on? I would think of it as really four key elements. So first really is in terms of definitions. So in Econs, we have a lot of key terms, right? Demand, supply, price, elasticity, and so on. Have that list, right? Have that focus as the first part, right? Definitions. Second is really diagrams. So diagrams actually is a hallmark of Econs analysis. You need to draw a lot of diagrams. So if you can actually capture that uh, in, your, in your mind, right? In your so-called memory palace, uh, that will really help you, right? When you go for the exams as well. So that's the second part. Third part is really in terms of the concept. So now that you have the definitions and you have the diagrams, how then do you link them together, right, into a coherent concept? How do you explain and elaborate on that? So that's really the third aspect. And to round it all up, it's really in terms of examples, right? So are you able to think of examples to substantiate your concept and to apply your concept? So I would recommend as students really, you know, as you go through the notes, as you come up with your own mind maps and your own glossary, Think about these four areas and that will really help you to study smartly. This, this encompasses actually the kind of notes that exactly. they should be focusing on, That's right? right? Yep. And so that they don't have to go through 80, hundreds of pages yep. know, to revise for Correct. the exam. That's right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. That's so important. Yeah. And um, can you tell us some of the topics um, uh, you know, needed for this uh, econs exam, mm. or, and then also, is it possible for students to be able to choose some of these questions from mm. the essay paper? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a very natural question as mm. well, because you know, just now we mentioned, right? There's so much topics and contents to go through for the students. So strategically, right? Tactically, the student will wonder: Can you focus on two or three topics and then give out some of the topics? So why is that, uh, you know, a thing, right? Why is that a thing for students? It's because actually you will know for the exams, um, for H2, there's actually an essay component. And the essay component is uh, comprises of different questions. And you can actually choose the questions that you want to tackle, right? So amongst uh, six questions, you can choose from there to tackle the ones that you would like to do. And this part here, students may wonder, okay, so I can choose, right? So can I then give up some topics? Don't study them all together. Mm. So for example, a lot of students will realize, right, firm theory and decisions, right? This is really a big killer. So a lot of times the diagrams and all are not intuitive. So they think, okay, I can't study so much, I'll give up this topic altogether. But what I would recommend is uh, it's not really a good idea to give up on one topic altogether. So let me tell you why actually. So there's a few reasons. So firstly, really you must think of econs, it's a, it's a building block approach. Mm. So when you study econs, what I mean by building block is that one concept is layered upon another, right? So they are all interlinked. So give me an example, right? So let's say you want to study demand and supply first, right? So you need to understand demand and supply before you can then go on to the topic on you know, market failure or firm decisions, right? Because if you don't know these basic concepts, yeah. it's very hard for you to appreciate how firms then uh, you know, internalize these, how they make use of it in their own decisions, mm -hmm. right? So it's all interlinked. So if you tell me you want to give up on something, the thing is, it becomes a very common pain point, especially among a lot of J2 students. Mm. So they tell you, oh, in J1, I didn't study this properly, I give up on it. So now in J2, I find it very hard to catch up because I don't understand this concept. Now I don't know that concept. I don't understand what the teacher is speaking in class. So that is actually a pain point. So that's also why I don't recommend for students to give up certain topics. And that's the first reason. Second reason as well is that just more tactically uh, for the purpose of the exams. Mm. So it's true that you can choose questions for essay. But it's also true that the Cambridge examiners can throw a spanner at you. 
So it doesn't mean that just because you like this essay or this topic, uh, then they have an obligation to make it as simple as possible for you. And in fact, you know, along the years, let me give you an example. So a lot of students, they like to focus on the topic on market failure because they think that, oh, it's very standard, right? So you look at this essay, just you think of these few points, memorize these few points, and I'm going to ace it. Then a lot of times, you know, there's a few years, Cambridge decided to come up with something very different in terms of how they ask the question. And then students get stuck. So they realize, oh, I can't do this question. So I studied all the way for this, I focus on this, and I realize I can't do it. Then they have no choice, but they have to turn to their art enemy, right? The firm theory and decisions. And then they do very badly because they didn't even study for that. So that's the second problem because Cambridge can throw a spanner and you, you have to be prepared for that, right? So it's, it's like life like that, right? So you have to put your eggs in different baskets. Don't put it all in one basket. It's not just for exams. Next time in life, you'll realize the power of diversification, right? So you know, that's the whole point of it, right? So don't put your eggs in one basket. Ensure that you have a reasonable grip grasp of different concepts, and that will be the part that will serve you well. Okay? And last, of course, more practically as well, you can choose questions for essay, but for case studies, you can't. Right? So the thing is, case studies, you have no choice, you have to do every single question. So if the topic that you don't like come out, right, then you have no choice but to do it. So my recommendation is essentially don't give up on a topic, but perhaps what you can do in place of giving up uh, is to do some kind of prioritization. So what you can do is, you know, spend some more attention on the topic that you're best at. So for example, demand and supply, you're super good at it. So really just focus, right? Really just back it, right? Go and look through all the past year questions, every single technique, every single type of answering method. Go and do that. Then for the ones that you're not so good, like firm theory and so on, maybe then deprioritize a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Ensure that you still know the fundamentals, that's of course. Ensure that you still know the concepts and definitions to be able to tackle a question. But you can just focus more on demand and supply first. Uh, and then this one, spend a bit less resources. So that's what I mean by being tactical yeah. and spreading out your eggs a bit in different mm. baskets. Well, I yeah. think this is a really, really valuable tips and you know, it's, it's, it's very strategic. Yeah. You know, whatever you have just uh, uh, pointed out and you know, advise the students. Mm. I think this is really something which they have to think about. Mm. And I totally agree with you because mm. If essay question you do not have a choice, then yeah. it is so risky for them yeah. to spot any topics. Exactly. Yeah. So I think for students it is important not to do so and not to let go of any topics that you feel that you're weak in, mm -hmm. right? But to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this question that students um, often ask mm -hmm. that you know they, they feel that context is really mm -hmm. important in economics, yeah. but uh, they do not really know how to, or they, they find difficulty in incorporating mm -hmm. contextual knowledge into mm -hmm. their essays. Yeah. So do you have any advice for them? Yeah, so actually that's precisely the nature of econs. Uh, context is king in econs, mm -hmm. right? And we often hear that. So a lot of students always hear, okay, teacher, you say context is king in econs, but what exactly do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. So the whole purpose of context in econs is that it really plays several objectives. So one is, if you understand the context, uh, it's because really econs questions and econs topics, you can think of it as essentially they are based on global developments. It's very much tied to our everyday life. So if you just you know, the newspapers now, read Business Times, Straits Times, you realize that a lot of things inside is interwoven, right, with our understanding of economics, be it in terms of COVID-19, be it in terms of climate change, be it in terms of technology and aging populations. They all have, uh, you know, interlinkages. So the thing is, you can't run away from context in econs, mm -hmm. right? You need context, number one, to be able to better appreciate the background in which your econs concepts are applied. Number two, you need context to be able to come up with good and detailed examples in order to substantiate your responses for your essay. So that's the part that's very important as well. And uh, essentially, number three, right? Number three is more practical. So the thing is, what I will see here is actually, if you look at the past year questions for A-levels, you'll realize that actually, in terms of the econs questions, they have really been focused on the key current affairs and global developments that have been happening in the past two or three years. And in fact, very interestingly, if you look at the essay questions, they are very, very focused on Singapore-specific developments. So why is it so practical here? It's because if you keep abreast of contextual knowledge, keep abreast of current affairs and global developments, it can very well help you to spot trending questions, potentially identify questions that can come out for the exams as well. So these are actually the three, what I call, use cases of appreciating the context for the cons. But exactly how do you go about acquiring that contextual information? 
So here, firstly, I would recommend you really to read widely, right? So read widely, read a range of journals, articles, and so on. And there are many good you know, news sources out there, you know, including amongst others, you know, Reuters, Bloomberg, Guardian. And these are actually the sources that Cambridge themselves draw upon when they come out with their case extracts for case studies, exactly. So they'll draw upon them to set questions. So if you have happened to just come across those articles, you may very well come across an actual exam extract. So that's the first part. And second part, other than just reading widely, is I would recommend to read purposefully as well. So that's very important. So a lot of times, students tell me, oh, teacher, you, I read a lot, you know, actually I read a lot of newspapers, then, but all this doesn't quite gel with me. So I ask, why is it that you read a lot, but you don't know all this, right? Then you ask them what they read. So they tell you, oh, I read about Squid Game, la, they win the Golden, Golden Globe Award, la, and that kind of thing. Right? So they don't read purposefully, right? They don't read with the aim in mind. It's really about engaging with the articles. And how do I recommend students to go about it when you, let's say you read a Reuters article, Bloomberg article, it's really to ask yourself. So for example, now um, inflation is a very topical area, right? A lot of times you know, here, central banks, they're all talking about inflation right now. So chances are if you flip the newspapers, you will see it, right? maybe not on the front page, maybe on the second page, right? And then when you look at these topics, first thing you have to ask yourself, right? Is think about it as an economist, right? How do you use econ's concepts to explain inflation? Okay, what are the factors that has led to inflation now, right? How does COVID-19 play a role? Right. What's the relevance of what I've learned right, in J2 in terms of macro econs? For example, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Uh, that's how you train your mindset. So every day as you are reading, uh, you're not just you know, ingesting information like a passive audience. You're really building muscle memory. Because the thing is, as you think through a, a topic, as you think about your own response to a topic, it will train you in terms of you know, when you formulate your response for the essay and the exams as well. That will be very useful, right? building that muscle memory acquiring this contextual knowledge and for example like i mentioned just now right there are a few very topical areas that you see especially in the past few years one is definitely covid 19. so what i would suggest is you should think about covid 19 what's the impact in terms of economic growth the impact in terms of unemployment the impact in terms of you know, supply chain disruptions and inflation in the country so that's one area second right is in terms of climate change so everybody has been talking about climate change for the longest of time but you really see in the past few years, it has really gained traction. Right? Global leaders, you know, policy makers, they're all coming together. Right? It's becoming more urgent. Right? So you know, the, the movie that we watch, right, Day After Tomorrow, right? uh, when you see the Statue of Liberty under the water, uh, it's becoming more immediate. Right? The threat is becoming more apparent. And really, it has a link with cons as well. So we will learn, as the J2 students will be familiar, right? in terms of economic growth, we talk about you know, not just inclusive growth, but also really in terms of sustainable growth. Right. So how do you then think about sustainable growth? How do you balance what we have been learning so long about maximizing GDP, maximizing growth with the need to protect the environment? And that has taken front and center stage right now. Mm -hmm. And last, of course, is that you know, evergreen technological advance. So you know, we have talked about a lot of different things here, right? So Facebook becoming meta, right? Going onto the metaverse, you know, a 3D environment where everybody can interact together. We talk about cryptocurrencies and bitcoins, right? So all these are very topical as well. And these are things that can very well come up for the exams, you know, in terms of you know how these trends can shape the global economies, how can it shape um, domestic economics, as well as even things like demand and supply. Right? So these are the things that students should really bear in mind as they really engage widely and purposefully right, with current events. Okay. Yeah. So I, I suppose when they come across an article yeah. and they read about it and they saw that, okay, this is the consequences of whatever has happened. So yeah. in between, they should also be trying to slot in the economics exactly. principle, exactly. right? To Correct. see how the application of the principle can result yeah. in this Correct. consequences. So you really hit the nail so on the head. So this is really purposeful reading, so exactly. to speak. Correct. Because yeah. actually you realize that econ's essays a lot of times they will ask about cause and effect. Mm. So they will tell you, this is the cause, this is the effect. Can you use an econ's concept to help me to you know, uh, illustrate what exactly is the linkage between the two? Mm. So like you mentioned, if you read the newspapers, if you put your muscle memory to, to heart, you know, trying to illustrate this linkage, it will definitely help you when you go and tackle the exams. Uh, mm. yeah. Okay, I think there are also many students, as they, uh, you know, as they run their marathon yeah. to the A level exam, yeah. right? They need to sort of prioritize which yeah. topics they should revise first. Mm. 
are there some simpler topics that you mm. know they can uh, start first? Mm. I mean, it's always like that. If we can accomplish some of the simple yeah. topics, then it, it you know it gives us a yeah. sense of accomplishment Correct. and yeah. confidence, you know, to yeah. move on to more difficult topics. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. And um, really, as I said, so econ is a building block, mm. right? And the thing is, you must always be best at the foundation. And I would say that really some of those foundational topics more in J1 is really in terms of demand and supply. And that's one of the first topics that you will learn, right? In terms of price mechanism, how is it that demand interact with supply in the market to give you the price and the quantity. So that part is what we call as the hallmark of econs. And in fact, once you understand that, that is really what we call as the bedrock right, of econs. You can then use it to better appreciate even macro econs as well. So in J2, you realize also there's another topic, right, which is more fundamental. Right? So I would argue that these are perhaps I wouldn't say they are easier, but I would say that they are more foundational. Right. And in being foundational, they are therefore very integral to the way you revise and study for the exams. So in J2, we have this you know, whole new you know, um, area other than just the, the micro econs demand and supply. We now have aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Mm. So as the name suggests in English, right? Aggregate, right? So you need to look at not just the demand for curry puffs or demand for Maoshan Wang Durian. Huh? You need to add all of them together. Add all of them together, aggregate them. Right? So you can look at all of it in the whole economy. Mm. And that is also that foundational topic in J2. Because once you can understand aggregate demand, aggregate supply analysis, it will better help you to understand you know, macroeconomic policies and objectives. So why is it that you know, as governments, why are we trying to promote uh, economic growth? Why are we trying to promote employment, you know, price stability, uh, mm. all this can be grounded on this aggregate demand and aggregate supply analysis. So I'll say that demand supply, ADAS, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, these are very foundational in that sense. Mm. Students, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I understand that uh, some of the modules that you'll be conducting yeah. very soon in March, uh, do you also um, prioritize in this, like yes. uh, the easier topic first or yeah. the foundational topic first before we moved on to the more difficult topics? Yes, so actually the, the modules themselves are structured to provide students with that comprehensive understanding of the econ's curriculum. And they were designed with these building block characteristics in mind. So if you look at that first batch of modules that we are doing, it actually encapsulates, you will actually include these two foundational modules. So the first one that I mentioned on price mechanism. So for J1, right, when you look at demand and supply, right, so that will be one module. The other module, as I also referenced just now, was introduction to macroeconomic analysis. So where we will learn more into aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and then we will think about you know, how this can help us to better understand the different objectives. For example, economic growth, unemployment, price stability, and so on. So indeed, right, this will be that first batch of modules that will provide that foundational understanding. And after that, we'll then layer that on with uh, other topics because cons there's, there's many other topics. So we'll then supplement with other topics like market failure, firm theory, macroeconomic objectives and other modules as well. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that the study aid is something yeah. that is so important, right? Yeah. Yeah. In order for students not to have to comb through mm. so many pages of mm. notes, right? Yeah. So in your modules, mm. with this very concise mm. notes that you mentioned about the study aid, mm. a very concise notes, would it be also provided there? Yes. And what else is provided in the modules? Yes. Yeah. So in this aspect, as we formulate the notes and the materials, we are very conscious about students' pain points. Mm. So one thing that was very conscious in my mind is how much you know, materials they have to trough through you know, if you look at their school materials. Yeah. So what we've done here is really to distill out the essence of what is needed for the exams. So as we prepare the notes, in a sense, it's what we call as a condensed set of notes, which I will consider as examination useful. Why is it called examination useful? It's because the content is useful for them when they tackle the exams. When they look at their essays, when they look at case studies, we will include you know, the definitions, uh, like, like I mentioned just now, right? The four elements. Yeah. Definitions, concepts, diagrams, examples. So that's what we will provide to them. And uh, you will equip them with the tools and the skill sets that will help them to better perform in the exams as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of examples as well, so just now I think we mentioned briefly about contextual knowledge. And so here what we have done is really, you know, we can't expect students to read newspapers all the time. No, GC students, I know they are very busy, right? The CCA is very exactly. late every day. So what we do here is we'll comb through the articles and we'll find some of those that are more timely. So you know, in the last few months or so, 
uh, things that are happening in the world right now. So mm. I mentioned just now about inflation, I mentioned about climate change and so on. Right? So these are the things that we will then extract for them within the notes as well. So it's really about providing that useful overlay, right? So that you not only have the concepts, but you also have the examples to substantiate the concepts. Mm. Yeah. It seems like it is a very, very, like you say, very concise and mm. exam ready yeah. kind of notes, yeah, right? Correct. So by relying on that, I think they are quite covered mm. for that uh, topic yeah. right, and ready for their A-level exams. Mm. And you mentioned there are some examples given. Mm. I suppose yes. those are some model essays right, yes. written yeah. inside there. Yeah. Uh, do you advocate uh, students memorizing them? Yeah. Exams. yeah, so actually that's that's a very good point. So I was also thinking about that when we talked about context just now. And it's very much interlinked. Because mm-hmm. the thing is, as we discussed just now, right? Econs is very much based on context. So there's really no one size fits all model answer, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of times students, you know, from young, right? Somehow they have this mentality. Okay, I'm going to just memorize this essay, you know, and it served me well for English and Chinese maybe. So in primary school, I memorized my Suowen, my essay, wow, I did very well for it. So I will do that in JC as well. Yeah. And then they realize they don't do as well, right? Mm-hmm. And why is that the case? So why is that the case? It's because context is king in cons. So let me give you an example, right? So we talk about demand and supply. So every student, right, if they memorize the notes, mm-hmm. they can probably regurgitate to you all the demand factors, all the supply factors. Why is it that demand for COVID masks is rising, right? Why is it that, you know, people are snatching the masks, right? Uh, they, can, they can think about it that way, right? The factors are all there. But they are unable to contextualize it, right? So for example, if I switch the question a bit, so maybe in the notes, the example is COVID mask. Then now I switch to Mao San Wang Durian. Ah, then you realize very interestingly, students in the exam, they will still give you factors on COVID mask, right? So uh, it's an extreme example, but it's a very practical illustration mm. of how they will memorize and they fail to adapt it to different situations. And that's why in Econs is very important because Econs, I can ask you anything under the sun, right? It's yes. a bit different from say history. History, if I, you know, in secondary school, I test you on Hitler, everything is going to be on Hitler, right? Yeah. But now it's different. I, I educate you on demand supply, that's true. But I can test you on anything. I can test you on COVID mask, I can test you on nurse, I can test you on Mao Shawang, you ran. Anything is you know, fit and ready. So you have to be ready for all these kind of questions. You have to appreciate the context. And that's why model essays are not quite useful if you memorize them because they are not as adaptable for use in terms of replicating it, in terms of replicating it, it's not so adaptable. But then, how do you use a model essay? Right? Because after all, model essays are there for a reason. So what I advocate is, in fact, model essays is something that we have as part of our own package, mm. as part of our own modules as well. And model essays, really what you need to do is, from there, to be really sensitized to the kind of approach that you tackle different questions. So when you see a question on demand and supply, right? You see a particular type of questions, you would know from the model essay that this is how you should structure it, how you should approach the question. Mm. Uh, that is the main thing that you should take away from the model essay. And then from there, okay, you can have some of the examples in your memory bank. For example, oh, this point was useful, so maybe I'll just put it in my memory bank. If a question comes out next time, I can include this content, right? So that's how we should use it more tactically. You shouldn't be just memorizing the whole thing, then vomit it out during yeah. the exam. Uh, that's not the that's way dangerous. to go about it. And that's very dangerous. Yeah. In fact, I can recall this story. It's very interesting. It's, it's a story of my friend. right? So my friend, is, uh, this guy called Jason. I don't think he watches this stream, so I think it's fair to use his name. <laughs> but it really left a very deep impression on me. It wasn't for Econs. It was for History. But it's the same idea. So actually, we were in secondary school at that time, right? So I take the same school bus as Jason. And then somehow, he doesn't do that well for History. So History also has essays, a lot of essays. And he doesn't do well for it, right? And he doesn't quite figure out why he can't do well. So on the school bus one morning, right, he told me, right? So he told me very seriously, oh Willun, I think I figured out the way to really do well for history. Like in a very, very serious, motivated kind of way. So I asked him, like, okay, so what exactly is your secret to success? Then he said, Yeah, my secret to success is I've memorized this first paragraph. So for every single essay for history, I'm gonna use this same first paragraph. And remember that that paragraph was about Hitler. So they talk about how Hitler became the Führer of Germany, right? So he founded the Nazi party in 1930s and so on. Very standard line. So he said, every essay I'm going to write this, and then it's going to help me. Because as long as I write this, right, it will save me some time, right? Uh, so the thing is, I can always start off like that, very standard, right? So he, he decided to do that, and he implemented that strategy. So, so you guess what's the outcome after he, he implemented that strategy? Do you think he did well? 
I mean, from the way you say, I don't think he did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly. So that was the whole point. So he still didn't do well. And I, from that day onwards, I always remembered the story of Jason. Mm -hmm. How memorizing doesn't work. Because that was what I did in primary school as well. I memorized a lot of Zorwen. And I realized actually it doesn't work when you go on to say JC and even further to uni. Memorizing doesn't make sense anymore. It's really about applying, right? It's really about learning, having a grasp on the concepts and then applying them in different contexts and situations. So I hope yeah. your friend Jason learns oh, from he's doing really well. well now. Yeah, yeah. So in spite of all that, I think he has learned his life lesson. And now he's doing it very well as well. So yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think one one other questions mm. which uh, one one other question which most students have mm. uh, because I think econs is everything about writing essay yeah. right yeah. be it short one or you know the long essay case mm. study everything is about writing essay mm. yeah. so uh, many of them have got this problem about mm. time management mm. Uh, mm. do you have any tips for them how they yeah. can manage better so actually time management is a very big problem in uh, econs in fact just now you mentioned about marathon right I think a lot of uh, students, they will actually associate marathon in particular with the econs exams and the econs essay. Because the thing is, especially for the essays, the thing is they have to write three long essays in two plus hours. Mm. And a lot of times they don't have time to finish all the essays. Because um, it's very long, it's a lot of writing. And a lot of times it's really, you know, the examiner say, get set, go, it's like a marathon. They have to write all the way to the end. In fact, a lot of times students will complain, they don't even have time to really think. So all they have to do is really just bet on what they have learned their you know econs lessons and all go to the exams rely on their muscle memory and just get going so it's really that kind of intensity you know, like a marathon right just get going from the start and never stop right so in this sense time management is actually very important because a lot of times students just get going they realize that they spend a lot of time on the first two questions and they realize actually they have no time left for the last question so sometimes students they just get zero for the last question because they didn't even have time to tackle or to even try it. So what I recommend is really firstly is it's really about having a game plan. Right? So what about this game plan is that it will help you to save a bit of time. At least first to have really a sense of your time allocation. So when you look at it in terms of essays, right? So it's about two hours, 15 minutes. You have three big essays to tackle for the essay component. You should really look at it in terms of one essay. You should stick to 45 minutes per essay. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with that 45 minutes? So for the five minutes, I would advocate really that first five minutes is really for you to plan, right? It's really for you to come up with the structure of the essay to kind of include the broad overarching points that you need to include within the essay. Why is this planning important? It's because a lot of times students, another challenge that they face uh, is because essays, you have a part A and a part B, mm. right? And then you realize actually some students, uh, so they happily write, right, write, write, write for A. Then when they come to B, they realize, oh, actually, it looks the same, right? A and B looks the same, but it can't be, right? Because Cambridge can't possibly be telling me Asking B, the same ah, correct. For yeah. the same answers, correct. Right? In fact, some students even say, so does that mean B, I can say, or examiner, please refer to it. Question B. No, right? That can't be the case. So it just shows that they didn't plan, right? If they had planned, they would realize this right from the start, and they probably wouldn't have tackled this question because of how tricky it was. So that planning part is important, right? So that first five minutes is important, and after that, really, it's about, you know, now, after the first five minutes, you have about 40 minutes, right? So then, part A is probably the, is usually the 10 marks question, right? So part A is usually 10 marks, so you can have about 15 minutes to work on that part A. And then part B is the harder 15 marks question. It typically requires evaluation, typically requires higher order thinking skills. So then you need a bit more time on it, so about 25 minutes. So use that parameters to guide you along, right? And have that discipline. So once, you know, you have reached that, milestone uh, in terms of the clock in the exam hall, you need to get on, right? So the thing is, a lot of times students don't do that. So they realize they have an overrun, right? And they still continue with part A, right? So, and then in the end, they run out of time. So they have no time for part B. And that's a mistake because it's always better that you get some marks on part A and then get some marks on part B mm -hmm. as compared to, you know, you, you don't know how you will do for part A and then you get zero for B for sure, yeah. right? So it's always tactical, always strategic in that sense, right? Yeah, so that's that's the two two things. One is discipline, yeah, tips. and having that game plan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think talking about time management, um, yeah. I think here we also have to manage our time. Yeah. yeah so uh, we have covered actually quite a lot of uh, uh, questions here, and we've given a lot of tips. And mm. I think we all need some time to uh, to digest. Right. It's yeah. it's really a lot of information, and uh, these are very very good uh, content that you have provided. 
So I think we still have quite a fair bit of questions, but I guess we will cover it in the next episode. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So we learn. We thank you so much for your time today, and we do hope that all of you have benefited somewhat, you know, and have some takeaways from today's session. And um, if you feel that there are some questions that maybe we have not covered, or you know, it can be it can be econs, it can be general paper, it can be JC maths or any other subjects, please feel free to post your questions in the comments below so that we can pick it up and you know have another session on it, right? And we do hope that you have enjoyed the session. And please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next episode.